So, uh, as you may have guessed, this is a hyphen story, on one level at least, from Denver to Durango. Um, but on another level, I've tried to incorporate a lot of the most recent science, uh, scholarly articles uh, on climate change in our mountain ecosystems. And specifically, I looked at some of these categories here about forests, wildfire, beetles, uh, mitigation, or wildfire especially. I looked at uh, wildlife uh, in the relation to climate change. Um, I also talked a little bit about apex predators, mainly wolves, mountain lions, um, in the book. Although it's, they're probably both fairly generalist species and not very vulnerable to climate change. In hydrology, so you've all heard about the Colorado River uh, and some of the drought uh, concerns with the Colorado River. I'll talk more about that in, as we go on. And also in the book, I tried to touch on some of what I call environmental history. Um, those of you who are kind of history boss may have heard that term before. Uh, it's becoming more common when people look about, look, take an environmental perspective of historical events. So in doing that, I had to talk a little bit about the native tribes, specifically the Utes, and I talked a little bit about Chief Uray, and I'll, I'll come back and touch on that. And the book also talks a little bit about our public lands, how they came to be, and uh, how they're managed, if you're not really familiar with our public lands. It's something we in Colorado really enjoy throughout the Rocky Mountain West and the, the far west. When I worked for BLM, we worked in the 12 western states, and I got to travel all over those states, including Alaska. So, um, some of that history has to do with the previous land uses um, that have been on, out there mining. Colorado has a rich mining history, and um, we have significant grazing, occasional logging in the, in the National Forest. Um, but the forest structure has changed, and I'll touch on that as well. And I'll kind of sort of wrap up uh, towards the end with um, population growth. I think that our climate issue, at least in Colorado, and actually nationwide, worldwide, uh, is not only a function of the greenhouse gases that were being emitted, but also in the vast expanse of the human population over time. So I, I thought it'd be useful to show some pretty pictures along the trail. The Colorado Divide Trail is the highest elevation trail in the country. Probably half of it is over 10,000 feet, and a lot of it's over 11,000 feet, and the highest point is over 13,000. I bet we have a few people in here who hike the Colorado Trail. Anybody? Well, it's 500 miles from Denver to Durango, and it's, it's a treasure, it really is, and it's in our backyard. I'm going to skip this. Um, basically, I'll let you read it for a second. Uh, basically, it talks about um, some of the temperature changes uh, in December of 2023. But I have some more information on this later. I think you all are probably aware of our, our climate is changing and the, our temperatures are going up. And in the Rocky Mountain West, especially, drought is also happening. So this is a map of the Colorado Trail. Um, beginning, I started over up there near Denver, Waterton Canyon. It kind of travels westerly through the Lost Creek Wilderness and through Pike National Forest. Uh, skirts over Kenosha Pass, north of Breckenridge, um, then it uh, gets into the Collegiate Peak Range. And I should point out, these are all wilderness areas. It crosses about six wilderness areas. Mount Massive Wilderness, Bleach Peaks Wilderness, uh, continuing on down to the Cochitope Hills, and uh, let's see, this is uh, La Garita Wilderness, and the Wayne Nooch Wilderness, which is the largest one in Colorado, down to Durango. So one distinction I'd like to make, and probably a lot of you are sort of aware of this, I think, but Weather is not the same as climate. 
So when you watch the weather on the news, uh, on television, they normally are talking about a forecast for the next few days. And so weather is really what's happening now in the short term. Climate is what's happening over the long term. So uh, climatologists and meteorologists who study this, if you ever watch Mike Nelson, he's really into this, um, they look at climate and climate history and it's the history of an area over decades, even centuries. And you can look, you can look at climate history for almost any town in Colorado. Just Google climate history for Longmont, and it will give you the records uh, for over a long period of time. So up through at least 2021, um, we have been in a, what's called a mega drought throughout the West. 1,200 years, according to a lot of scientists, the driest period for 1,200 years. And you might ask, well, how do they know that? Scientists take um, cores and lakes, sediment cores. They also study um, tree rings. It's called dendrology and dendrochronology. Um, they even look at glaciers. They drill glaciers and they get an age the cores for the glaciers. So they can determine uh, from that data basically what our climate has been for several thousand years. Precipitation has been declining. I think probably most of you are aware of that. We've been in a dry spell here locally. Now we finally got a little bit of moisture. One of the things that uh, I'll mention later on, and I'll go ahead and mention it now, some of these papers that I collected talk about in the future, in the not too distant future, certainly the future for my daughter and my granddaughter, we could have a low to no snowpack in our mountains. Now, if you think about that, if you've never heard of that, that's a pretty scary thought because the mountain snowpack is our vast water storage in the sky, if you, if you will, or water fountain in the sky. It slowly melts and releases water all summer long and even into the fall. And what's going to change is a lot of that's going to come as rain or maybe rain on snow, which melts really fast. So that's the concern. If you're a skier, if you're a water uh, utility manager, if you're a farmer, it's a concern. So I mentioned in 20, uh, excuse me, 2020 and 2021, I, that, those are years I did my hike. We were in extreme drought those years, and I have a couple of pictures if there's time at the end that kind of highlight that. We had a winter in 2023. The snowpack was actually pretty darn good. It kind of restored some of the levels in Lake Mead or Lake Powell. Along the Colorado Trail uh, in the San Juan Mountains is a place where there are headwaters of both the Rio Grande and the Colorado River. Um, some of the water goes down via the Animus, some of it goes down to the Gunnis and to the Colorado, and the Rio Grande headwaters are there too. So it's kind of like an apex point where the watershed has been higher. One other issue maybe is this loss of the reflected snowpack. So scientists use the term albedo which has to deal with reflected reflection of the sun's rays off the ground and back up. So off of snow, there's a lot of reflection. If you're a skier, you know you're gonna get sunburned on a sunny day if you don't put sunscreen on. It's not so much from above, although that's strong, but a lot of it's bouncing off the snow and back onto your eye. And if we lose that snowpack, if it's like mostly gone, the, the surface of the ground of the earth in the winter is dark covered. It absorbs heat. And so that's a concern as well. Kind of a, a scientists use the term of tipping points and feedback loops and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just an, another cool uh, scene along the trail on the high tundra. One of the buddies I was hiking with. Not a lot of rain on the Colorado Trail. We get the uh, North American monsoon. This is kind of cool. This is, uh, you can see the trail just going on and on and on. Oh, and a little bit, 
but it's just so scenic. You get so many views, uh, miles and miles of views. This is the high point. It's not rocky, it's not a summit really, 13,271 feet. And this is up near where I was talking about all the watersheds divide. So that's kind of cool. You get to look down over one side, look down over another side. This is further on, west of Monos, Monos Pass. Um, and uh, notice here is the pretty healthy looking forest. And I'll, I'm gonna come, I'll mention this a little bit later. So this is west of Mollus Pass. Some more high divide pictures. And it's not hard hiking, really. I mean, the rain can make it hard if you have any interest in it. You, know, you need to kind of be prepared for rain and lightning. You don't want to be in these high exposed places in a lightning storm. <coughs> so this is the meat of it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go through this pretty quickly. Um, Part of, like I said, I've tried to do in the book, summarize a lot of the scientific papers. So you may have heard, you probably already know, that our forest structure is not what it should be or what it was before white Europeans came. Uh, the Native Americans used to burn a lot of the lower forests to open them up, the Pongros Pine Forest, which that zone we call the Montane Zone. Um, so, they burned a lot, and when settlers started coming in and miners, um, it was kind of open. And then the miners basically cut down vast amounts of timber. All of the front range pretty much was cut. Areas around Leadville and Cree and Silverton, all just completely cut. And all that wood was used to short the mines and to make a coke to burn for the steam engines that they used for the mining. And um, of course, people for firewood and to build their wooden shacks and houses. And so, um, what happened is all that you know, area was deforested, and then it started coming back as mining started to slow down. So, we, now we have all these even age forests, and they've come back fairly dense because of all the fire suppression, the smoking of air um, program that the Forest Service. Uh, gave to us for the last 50 or 60 years. And so the Forest Service has actively tried to put out every forest fire until recently. And now they're letting some of the fires burn that are in more remote areas, which is a good thing for the forest. But it's a bad thing also for diseases, especially insect pests, bark beetles, particularly the pine beetle north of I-70 and the spruce beetle south of I-70. And I'll talk more about that. And fire, I'm just gonna jump to this one. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you are, even here along the Front Range, we've had a lot of wildfire. If you're all from Longmont, Boulder area, you know that. Uh, Boulder County's had, had seven or eight fairly significant wildfires. Some have been pretty hard scared. The Marshall Fire, um, which was a grass fire. There was the in-car fire right, right above Boulder that could have easily gone right into town. But fortunately, they got out quickly, and the um, city of Boulder had been doing cleaning projects there, which I think helped. But what the scientists are finding when they go back and look at these fires that occurred in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, even 25 years ago, they are not regenerating with conifers or evergreens. Aspens can re sprout up from the roots. So if you've been to the Hayman Fire area, burn area, which is southwest of Denver. For many years, it was the largest fire in Colorado. 2002 was when it burned. I've been to the Hayman uh, burn scar several times. Um, and you get a lot of shrubs coming up. You get aspens in the gully, the roof sprouting because it's moisture there. But the actual conifers are not there. You can just go um, in many places in Boulder County, like the Walker Ranch fire. If you've ever been there, it's one of the Boulder County parks. Um, it burned about 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, and there's no regrowth. So scientists mainly out of CU Boulder have been studying these areas, and also all around the West, and we're finding in these montane areas, what's going on is um, the seeds from conifers are fairly large. They're not wind dispersed. They can't just blow into the burn area. 
The only way they can get there is to be carried by animals like a nutcracker, Clark's nutcracker, and squirrels, uh, maybe a few other birds. And so in an actual fire or a star, um, nothing can get out there, or if it does, uh, some of the organizations have been doing planting, replanting of conifers, conifer and unless you water them, they're going to die. The temperature of the surface of the ground can get, in the summertime, can get to be 120 or 30 degrees. If there's no moisture in the soil, even if the seedling gets, um, if it germinates and starts to grow, the roots are real shallow and they easily die. And it's just, um, in the olden days, you know, before we started messing around with the forest, there were still enough trees canopy, we would get lower intensity fire. Even the Native Americans did that, or if it was lightning in August. Now we're getting these high severity fires that actually destroy the soil and all of seed bank. And so it's pretty grim for those, those areas now. So, so I started in 2020, very dry, and we started in, oh, probably July. If you start too early, there's too, generally too much snow, but that's changing. So 2020, we had these Troubles and Creek Fire, the Cameron Peaks Fire, uh, together, uh, and another one, Pine Creek Fire, over 700,000 acres of the worst summer ever in Colorado for wildfire. And it displaced the Haven fire for the largest fire. So now, I forget, either East Troublesome or Cameron Peaks are the largest, Haven is number three. But here's a cool stat. Uh, historically, if you looked at wildfire, total wild, wildfire burns, 1960s to 1990s, they only averaged about 20,000 acres per year. And in the 2000s, that decade, they averaged about 85,000 acres per year. In the 2010s, they averaged about 100,000 acres per year. I don't have a figure for the uh, 2000, um, the teens, you know, from 2011 to 2020 now, unfortunately. But this kind of fire is going to push that up significantly. So I, I hiked through some clear cuts. The Forest Service doesn't call them clear cuts. They call them fuels mitigation. Sort of like pretending that they're thinning the forest for wildfire purposes. Really, it's a commercial timber sale. So there's a little bit of mischief, I think, going on with that. There's a lot of talk about thinning. Uh, city of Boulder, Boulder County do thinning. Um, many areas are now doing thinning. So if you think about it, if you imagine a fairly dense uh, stand of forests, of conifers, really what you want to do is save the larger trees and thin out the small trees, uh, particularly that serve as ladder fuel. If a fire starts across the ground surface, it can burn up through the smaller trees and catch the larger trees on the fire. And we need the larger trees, they're the mother trees. They're the ones that mostly reproduce. So when thinning is done, they really need to get the small trees and brushed out of there. Uh, and really what the logging industry wants to do, they want the big trees. They're the ones that are commercially valued. So that's the conundrum that the Forest Service is in. Fire season is year round. Yeah. So this is a shot of the Hayman fire. I'm not sure of the date of this, but it was uh, relatively recent. I stole this off of the internet somewhere. But this kind of makes the point I, I wanted to make is that there will be regeneration next to this edge area where the, the seeds can fall down onto the ground. But unless they're carried by animals out into this ginormous burn star, which is like 10 miles across, they really don't have a chance. So we have a beetle problem as far as our forests, and it's probably as significant as wildfire if, you're, if you like our forests. So everybody turned the mountain pine beetle, this is what it looks like, it's only about a quarter of an inch long. I used to have property up on near Genesee, and we had pine beetle, and I had property up in my conifer, and it got pine beetle attacks, and I had to cut whole bunch of large ponderosas down and just made me sick. 
but that's mainly north of I-70. Uh, south of I-70, it's more of a spruce beetle problem. You don't hear so much about that, but it's actually probably bigger than the pine beetle. So both beetles drill into the cambium of the tree, and the tree tries to flush out with the sap through the hole that they make to try to flush out the larva that they lay in the eggs. But too many beetles or drought conditions combined weaken the tree and cause mortality. It used to be on a two-year life cycle, but because of our warmer winters, they're now on a one-year life cycle, and it puts more beetles on the landscape. Similar story with the spruce bark beetle. There's a picture of it um, throughout the south, especially the southwestern part. If you've driven over Wolf Creek Pass or even Monarch Pass, you just see that the forest is mostly got at least three quarters of dead trees, and that's what's going on. Um, 1.8 million acres uh, in Colorado have been killed by a spruce beetle. In the San Juan National Forest and the Rio Grande National Forest down along the Colorado Trail, about 40% mortality of uh, spruce trees, which is really mostly what's made up in subalpine forest. People also often ask, are the beetle killed forests a greater fire hazard? So if you look at this, this is a spruce beetle uh, kill that I walked. This is right along the trail. So you think, wow, one match would really set that off compared to um, other forests that I showed pictures of. Not really true. Um, a lot of the most of the needles are gone. A lot of the smaller twigs are gone. Uh, even though if it's pretty dry, certainly it will burn. But it needs smaller fuels to get the thing going, as opposed to these sorts of trees in a drought, these are living, some of these are living here. Um, in a drought situation, there's a lot of needles there and they can easily catch fire and develop into crown fires. So this is really not necessarily um, a greater fire hazard. Here's some more distant landscape shots of spruce beetle kills down in the San Juan. This is kind of what it looks like going over Wolf Creek Pass. All the gray in here are dead trees. There are some green areas. It's just, it's just landscape level mortality. A few words on wildlife, and I'm probably accepting it okay time wise. Maybe you've heard about the science of phenology. Phenology has to do with seasonal changes for plants and animals. So a flower grows up and blooms. Pollinators come along, bees and butterflies and moths and even bats, and they pollinate it and it sets fruit and seed and reproduces. What hap that's happening now is the flowers and other flowering plants are doing so earlier because the snowpack is melting sooner and it's getting warmer, and the pollinators haven't caught up. So at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, which is near Crested Butte, which is near excuse me, near Gothic, which is near Crested Butte, they've been studying, some people have been studying these relationships for almost 50 years. And they have published a bunch of papers on how pollinators have a sync with the plants. And we can have maybe similar larger problems statewide when you think about it, because there's a lot of concern about our pollinators, even along the front range. There's a western bumblebee that uh, frequents the alpine areas. They're down at least 70%, uh, probably even more than that. Bird species, we've lost like 3 billion birds, according to like the Audubon Christmas uh, Day, the Christmas bird count, and other data. Skipping down here, there's a researcher at CU who studies small mammals uh, in Colorado. And she's finding that the ranges are shifting up the mountain by hundreds of feet, 430 feet. There's been concern about pica. Those are those little critters that look like hamsters, kind of. If you've seen them on the trail or when you're out in the higher elevation skiing, even, well, probably not skiing, too much snow in the but, um, They can't stand temperatures really above 70 degrees. And the fear was that they would die. And they're already pretty much as high as they can go on the mountain. They can't go much higher. They're already there. 
problems. But it's, we're finding out the pike are actually probably a little more adaptable than we thought. So during the heat of the day, they just go underground. These big boulder fields where you see pythons, they just drop down, you know, six feet into the crevices. A lot of those places have what they call what are called rock glaciers that are hidden underground, and the, and the water down, you know, maybe ten feet, it's all frozen, and it's actually a glacier. Here's a few species I think that are vulnerable to climate change. Both the lynx and the snowshoe hare are uh, there through the winter. And if uh, snowshoe hares don't get enough snow, you know, they turn white in the winter, right? And um, so they're an easy target for lynx. And without snowshoe hares, the lynx will die. That's pretty much their main diet. Colorado doesn't have any wolverine. They like high and cold areas. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is talking about reintroducing wolverines. Uh, I have concerns about whether or not that's realistic in the future. I'd love to see wolverines. Moose, they're critters that like colder weather. Their big bodies are designed uh, to handle it. Uh, we have a moose population in Colorado that's doing pretty well. Up in Wyoming, for some reason, they're not doing so well. Cutthroat trout. They need to reproduce in cold water. And if the streams are not at a certain temperature, they can't reproduce. And cutthroat trout are threatened in Colorado. Even bats. So I'm kind of getting to the growth question. So I've been in Colorado probably 55 years. And uh, I've seen the Colorado population growth grow from about 1.3 million to over well, about 6 million. That's like a five-fold increase. And if you're a long-time Colorado resident, you know what I'm talking about. We've got traffic, we've got air pollution, we've got um, a lot of other urban issues related to our populations. But they're impacting our mountains and our, and our um, ecosystems as well. Um, you can read some of this. The WUI is W-U-I is the Wildland Urban Interface. And we're finding that in Colorado, of that six million, one to three million live in the WUI. All you have to do is drive above Boulder or Golden or any of our canyons along the front range and elsewhere around the state. Go up to Steamboat Springs or Dale or any of those ski areas. You know what I mean? People like to live up in the woods. They like to live in the trees. I liked it. I lived in the Wooly for many years. The problem, of course, is wildfire. And I have some friends from Conifer. Um, they do have fire insurance because they've been there a long time. Uh, people who are buying houses in the Conifer and Evergreen area, they can't get fire insurance. Or if they get it, if they're lucky enough to get it, it's extremely expensive. The same is true in California, that's really been hit by a lot of big fires and elsewhere around the country. I'll toss in, uh, people who live in Florida, not so much fire, but sea level rise. Seriously, that is going to happen. And um, don't buy land near the coast because it's probably going to get flooded or washed away. So wildfire mitigation is necessary in the WUI, especially the low elevation forest thinning. I've kind of touched on some of the pros and cons. Uh, logging causes more carbon emissions and is the least eco ecologically sustainable compared to thinning. And pres prescribed fire is probably the best way to go. But managers, land managers are afraid to take the risk of it getting out of control. It's happened too many times. It really needs to be done on a non-windy day, uh, preferably in the winter, um, when there's snow on the ground. And also, if you've seen thinning areas, uh, going back to thinning, they do the thinning and they pile up these big slash piles, seriously, like 30, 40 feet high. And they're just sitting there, all this dead stuff. And initially, there's a lot of pine needles in there and um, other spruce needles and so forth. 
it's like all it takes is one pyromaniac to set that baby off and you have one of the hugest bonfires you can imagine. So as far as solutions, um, we do need to do these things. Logging, I know it's a, it's a management directive uh, in the legislation for the Forest Service to provide uh, timber for the nation. Um, I heard not long, well, pretty long time ago, that there never, has never been a timber sale in Colorado that made money for the government. It's basically a subsidy for um, people who, whose occupations and livelihood depend on money. So I'm kind of wrapping up here. Um, this is along the Colorado Trail somewhere. So I mentioned I talked a little bit about Chief Uray. So this is me in my Indian costume. So I want to tell a quick story. Um, my dad uh, was about a quarter Ogallala suit. And um, so therefore, I, I'm an eighth. And my dad um, decided how much to share here. He was an FBI agent. And even when we lived in Indiana when I was a kid, uh, he was really interested in his Native American heritage. And he actually owned a grazing allotment on the Pine Ridge Reservation in, in South Dakota that he inherited from his uh, mom. And um, so he got really interested in this stuff and he developed what we call it back then was a costume. And it originally it's like turkey feathers and beads and he gradually got more authentic stuff. We did Indian dancing with scouting all over India, southern Indiana when I was a kid. And uh, then we moved to Wyoming when I was in high school. And he got a transfer to Riverton, Wyoming, which if you know it is in the middle of the Wind River Indian Reservation. Any major crime on an Indian reservation is investigated by the FBI. And he was the only agent that had to cover not only that, but most of the Western half. Wyoming at the time. So uh, he started making some friends with the Indians and trying to develop, you know, introduce himself and meet people and go to powwows. And pretty soon he told him he had a costume. I said, come on, you gotta come dance. So he brought his stuff along and he would dance with them. And I was like in high school and he dragged us out there. Was, they called them powwows. Uh, I guess they still call them that, but I just heard recently that's a derogatory term. But we would go out there and they would dance until like one or two in the morning and I'd be falling asleep. But, uh, so one day we were home and the fish and game guy uh, came by, or maybe Federal Fish and Wildlife Service, I don't remember, with like three eagle carcasses that were golden eagles. And they had been electrocuted. And so he comes over to my dad. You know, there's not a lot of, lot of law enforcement in Riverton in the 70s. Like my dad was the, not the only federal law enforcement person. And he said, I don't know what to do with these things. He said, I think, you know, you should take them and decide what to do with them. I said, no, 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 I can't do that. You know, I'm not allowed to possess eagle feathers. There's a law against that unless you're a Native American. Uh, so uh, he, he kept pressing and pressing. My dad says, okay, well, I'll hold them for a bit and I have to make some calls and clear it with the federal magistrate of Cheyenne. So he did, and the federal magistrate said, well, you're enrolled in the tribe, and you know, you're know you part blood, Native American, and I think it's fine. So um, the, what happened then is my dad called up the, some of his friends from the reservation who were dancers and had costumes, and he says, I've got these eagles, and I want to donate them to you so that your, you and your children can make more regalia. And they said, oh, we'd love to have them. So they came and got them and um, took them away, and we thought everything was, was done with all that. So like a month or two later, maybe three months, um, they came back to the door, the same people, and they said, we have something for you. So they brought up this beautiful eagle feather headdress and a beautiful eagle feather bustle. The bustle goes on the rear, 
and tassels and the whole thing, you know, when you move around, it just the whole thing moves. And I guess, no, I like that too. And, but again, the magistrate said, well, yeah, go ahead. So my dad lived another 25, 30 years after that. And he passed away. And I inherited all this stuff. And I'm not at the role in the tribe. And I'm less blood than he is. And uh, I didn't feel like I could keep them. And so I'm going to shorten this story a little bit. So I noticed that there was a power on every. And I was living um, near Golden at the time. So I went up there, and there was Cheyenne, and um, I think uh, Arapaho, maybe. I'm not sure. Up there, this power. And I watched, and at the end, I went up to one of the dancers and I said, You know, I had this eagle headdress and this eagle muscle on, and they're not technically allowed to have it. Would you, would you or one of your compatriots there be interested in taking it? He said, Oh, I would love to have it. So the next day we met up and I just gave the stuff to him and repatriated the eagle feathers, which kind of closed the circle. So this is what's left of this costume. I don't have the eagle headdress and bustle anymore. That's a turkey feather of a headdress. And this was an old buckskin outfit he had. I still have the beaver. Um, he also had a fancy dance costume, which uh, is completely different, but very showy. And he liked to dance and dance. So, um, my connection with Chief Your Ray is he reminded me when I read about more about Chief Uray and reminded me a lot of my dad. He was a, um, they say he was a charismatic leader, not among all of the youths, I guess not everybody, but um, he spoke like three or four languages, amazingly. Uh, and he could speak some Spanish, he could speak obviously uh, Ute and English and uh, maybe French or something else. So he was a good communicator, and when the, all these treaties came along that were forced down the throats of the youths, and that's a whole study in by itself. If you got to see the, uh, the St. Creek Massacre uh, exhibition at the Denver uh, History Museum, uh, they also talked about the youths and how their reservations kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. One treaty would come along after another, the whites would break each one of those and force them to treat them, and eventually force them totally out of the state, except for the southern view. The mountain youths got sent off to Utah. But uh, I'd like you to, if you get my book and read about it, my dad reminded me of what I thought Chief Uray might be, and then I also wondered, what would Chief Uray think about what we've done with our ecosystems. I mean, there were whites already, quite a few in the state when he died, which I think was probably in the 1880s. But in just 150 years, we have transformed the landscape in only 150 years. And the youths were here for centuries. And so, imagine, just imagine what Chief Uray would think. Um, that's, I'm going to end on that. I would like to um, hopefully you have some questions you might want to ask of me. And I have a few books for sale if anybody's interested. The library has a copy, and every time I check on it, it's checked out. So I might have to donate some more. But any questions from the group? Yes? Part of the production uh, about the uh, resource of that Gothic. Part of the what? studying the, the forest up there at Gothic. At uh, where? Crested Butte. At Crested Butte? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not officially that's, part of it. I've been there. That film, there was a film on it on PBS in the last Yes, month. and it's excellent. Yeah. Yes. Um, she's saying that the PBS folks had a, they do have a documentary. I think you can still find it on YouTube. Having to do with this uh, phonology and the plants being out of sync with the pollinators and it shows um, video of the actual experiments that they were doing in the field. And they would shine these uh, heat lamps on the ground to mimic warming. And then they would measure growth and abundance and presence of plants and when they were pollinated. It's really um, good stuff. 
Yes. Do you know the name of that documentary? I don't. Um, do you know the name of it? I don't know. No, I, I'm going to go look it up on PBS locally and see what they did over the last month. So I'm going to give you my email, and I, if you want to email me, I'll find out. My email is pretty easy. It's Earth Forward, Earth like Planet Earth Forward, my last name, at AOL.com. So I'll find out, and if you email me, um, I will get it for you. Yes? You talked about taking core samples from glaciers. Yes. Where, where in Colorado were you, were you getting the glaciers? So I don't think the glaciers, the Colorado glaciers are piddly tiny. There are like 14 named glaciers in Colorado, and they're typically only 10 acres, 20 acres or less. So I don't think they were in Colorado. I think they were probably elsewhere around the west. Uh, by the way, the glaciers in Glacier National Park have about another decade or two, and they would be gone. There used to be like 180 of them, and there was like 20 left. More questions? Oh, hopefully. Yes? Did you do collegiate east or west? I'm sorry? Did you do collegiate east or west? I've done both. In fact, I've done west twice and east once. And the west is more scenic, it's a little more difficult hiking, more up and down, and better elevation. Um, but yeah. So the Colorado Trail, if you didn't notice, it sort of bifurcates in the middle and there's a collegiate east and a collegiate west route, and you can choose either one. Did you have a question? No, I was just... Anybody want to hike the Colorado Trail after I've talked to you about it? Um, I'm an ultralight hiker, so uh, really recommend that you uh, learn about ultralight hiking because let me give you an example um, when i was in my 20s i did like a 70 mile backpack in yellowstone and my pack weighed 50 pounds with mostly with my head food in it but still for seven days and now i just did a backpack on the john Muir trail in the sierras and my backpack with seven days of food would be about 22 pounds so it is quite possible to you know Think about what you're bringing and get your weight down. It might cost you some money. I mean, to get a lightweight tent or tarp and a lightweight sleeping bag and, and, and a hair mattress. Um, and again, if you have interest in learning about um, ultralight hiking or about any of this kind of stuff, I have a website. I'm just starting to put up, but if I don't have, I'm going to change the name of it because I don't want to. If you're interested, um, email me, earthforward.aol.com. Um, I'm going to probably put up their tips for, for ultralight hiking and stuff. How, how busy was the trail you hiked the last time? How many people were on it? Oh, how many people were on the trail? Before I answer that question, let me say the Appalachian Trail started in Georgia in the spring, and there were a zillion people started. When I started PCT in the Mexican border in the spring, there were a zillion people. But as you progress along the trail, they spread out and a lot of people drop out. And um, the Colorado Trail, so I started during 2020, it was the pandemic still. And uh, there weren't many people out there, which is great. Uh, I also was hiking in 2021. And you know, you, you can go all day in a lot of places, maybe just see one, two, three, four people. Not many. So, I mean, if you like to get out and get a little bit of solitude, especially the western half, um, not nearly as many people. When you get within a day of like, Durango or Breckenridge or Leadville, uh, a few more people there because people, some people are either day hiking or just out for a couple of days. So, like they call that section hiking if you're doing like only a portion. A lot of people, if you're a working person, when I first did the Colorado Trail, I didn't have the time to go from point A to point B at the end. I had to kind of nibble away at it over a number of years. And, um, you know, weekends and 
little vacation here, a little vacation over like many years to get it done. And in fact, I didn't even think it wasn't my plan to finish it when I started. It was just and pretty soon before I knew it, I'd done over half of it. I thought, I might as well finish this. But that was like in 2007. Yes? Two questions. Um, have you gone both ways, or have you only gone south slash west? And out of the trails that you've done, the long distance trails, what was your favorite? My favorite? Yeah. yeah. So on Colorado Trail, both times, I basically went from Denver to Durango. Um, I may have done, on the first time, I may have done some in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. so, that was a long time ago. My favorite, um, I get asked that often. So th they're all so different. The Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail. And the Appalachian Trail is, they call it the Green Tunnel. You're in the forest canopy, mostly in deciduous trees the whole way. But you start in the spring, and what happens there, the trees are bare, and you're going through this deep forest, and it's all brown, and then a few weeks later, all these um, annual flowers just come up by the trillions, and they just carpet the ground. And it's just literally flower gasping. And then a little bit later, like in um, early June, the rhododendrons bloom, and the whole mountainsides can be covered with rhododendron flowers. Uh, they have shelters along the AT every 10 miles. It rains a lot, so its shelters are handy when it's raining a lot. <laughs> a lot of people on the AT until I got in the, fruit, the more northerly areas, like in Vermont, New Hampshire, the White Mountains in New Hampshire are harder than they have. The AT is tough. It's the toughest one of the three. It's just up and down, up and down. And there are no switchbacks. Whereas the Colorado Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the PCT is more gentle, and it's switchback over the passes. Um, and it was also, the AT was really hot and humid at the morning by the time I got in the late summer. Um, so that's the AT. Uh, it was beautiful though, and I enjoyed it. I almost quit when I got to Maine, though. I was just so physically and mentally tired. But all my family members were urging me to keep going, so I, I made it. Um, the Continental Divide Trail, which 300 miles of the Colorado Trail is the same trail as the Continental Divide Trail for those 300 miles. And um, this, the CDT is much more remote, many fewer people. I went through most of Wyoming until I got to Yellowstone. I didn't see hardly anybody in the whole state until I got that far. There's grizzly bears in the CDT. There's all the big uh, animals, um, moose, uh, elk, two uh, species of deer, bighorn sheep, mountain goats, uh, mountain lions, wolves, grizzly bears, bison. But the other two trails don't have the wildlife like that. The AT and the, uh, has black bears, that's about all you see. It's not a lot of black bears. Um, and then the Pacific Crest Trail has bears also. Uh, you don't see them so much now. You have to have these bear canisters and carry them where there are bears. Um, but not a lot of wildlife on the PCT. But man, is it beautiful. The High Sierras and the Northern, the Northern Cascades, just awesomely, spectacularly beautiful. Any other questions? Yes? Can you bring your racing burrow? Have I done that? <laughs> Let me tell you another real short story. I have race burrows. Are we running out of time? Okay. I have race burrows, but not in Colorado. A real short story. I'll take one minute on this and then we'll wrap it up. But I worked at the Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico when I was in college. Has anybody been to Philmont? Oftentimes I run into people who have. It's the largest adventure youth camp in the world. And you can hike for 70 miles in a straight line and still be on the ranch. And it's in the mountains uh, near, near Cimarron, New Mexico. And so one of the backcountry camps that I was a camp director at, we had burrow racing as a program for the scouts. And basically, we had burrows at our camp in a big corral. 
in, in a small corral. We turn up the burrows into the small corral, which is about the size of this room. We could push like 20, 30 burrows in there. And the jobs, and we'd show these guys how to pack a burrow. And um, with the pack saddle and panisters and the canvas, and throw a diamond edge over the top. And then it was their job to, having caught a burrow, which was always hilarious, they had to put a, a bridle on the burrow, bring it out, and then pack it, and then race up the meadow around the tree and race back. And they were all racing at the same time, teams of two. And there'd be like 20 burrows at, one, at once, in some stage of the race. And some kids couldn't even catch a burrow, some of them couldn't pack it because the burrow kept throwing it off. And others were racing up the mountain or the hill and back down, and everybody was screaming and so nervous. But what you're referring to is uh, in Leadville and Fair Play, they have these big races, like marathons kind of races. And again, you have to have a pack burrow with certain specifications. I don't know how much weight. And so the runner runs along with the burrow up the ski pass or whichever route they take. And it's it's a marathon, a high elevation marathon with a burrow. You've got to have a burrow that likes to run. So there's that. Okay, I'm going to finish. Um, if anybody's interested in buying a book, I'm selling them here at a significant discount. They're available on Amazon. They're also available through my publisher, which is the University Press of Colorado. And they're online, UP Colorado. So you're welcome to go there. Thank you. Um, my name is Denise, and I'm on the staff here at the Longmont Library. I wanted to just take a minute and let you know that um, all of our programming that we do here, whether it's kids, teens, adults, is funded by the Friends of the Longmont Library. They do so many things to help us be able to bring this, like book sales and things like that. So if you um, get a chance to come to the book sales and help support, or if you see someone in a yellow apron, usually on a Thursday, if you could thank them, that'd be amazing. Um, otherwise, yeah, feel free to ask some questions and sign some books. We're going to be in this room for a couple more minutes. Yeah, I'll hang out for a little bit if you want to book. I just want to chat. <laughs>